Hi friends and welcome to this week's episode. I still get a lot of questions about hormone pellets, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit more in detail about hormone pellets and specifically why I chose to use them in my own body out of the other choices for hormone replacement. And there are other choices for sure, so I'm not saying it's the only way, but let's talk about why someone might choose hormone pellets. And we're just going to assume for the sake of this conversation that we're already on board with the idea that taking hormone replacement is a good idea uh, because that's already been talked about quite a lot in the past on this channel. So let's just assume that we're postmenopausal or perimenopausal woman and we're looking at the options for how we're going to replace those hormones that have declined with age or disappeared. As you know, when we're menopausal, estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone all drop to levels that are either zero or really close to it. And we all know all of the symptoms that go along with that. And if you don't, I'll refresh your memory by referring to some earlier videos. But now we come in with some options of what to do to replace those hormones. So talking about estradiol first, that's the primary estrogen that we make as women from puberty throughout our fertile lives and then all the way to menopause, which is when estrogen drops to zero or close to it. We know that hormone is responsible for so many important things. Not only does it cause hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, skin dryness, insomnia, a list of other yuckies when it drops to levels below about 40 or so. Also, we know that it increases the risk of osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, heart disease, colon cancer. Sounding a little bit like a broken record at this point, I know, but replacing estradiol is a great idea. So what are the rules, so to speak, about how to get this in our system in a safe way and also one that's workable with our lifestyle? Well, we know from all of the many, 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 many studies that have been done on hormone replacement accelerating over the past 20 years since the Women's Health Initiative study that now we know all about, scared us into thinking that hormones were dangerous. There's a big acceleration in studies to try to dig into that and figure out a better way to do it. Even though that wasn't dangerous, there are better ways to use hormones. And one of the things that we've known forever, was since way before I started practice, was that taking estrogen by mouth can increase the risk of blood clotting situations, like the kind of clot you get in your leg that goes to your lung, we call that a pulmonary embolus, or even a stroke. And even young girls taking birth control pills, for example, occasionally can have that complication. So we've known about that forever, and not surprisingly, when we take estrogen by mouth, when we're older, those risks are even a little bit higher. Having said that, the risk is still really small if you take estrogen by mouth, but if you use it in some kind of non-oral form, that's not a pill, that risk disappears. So that's amazing, right? So what are the choices if we're going to choose estradiol in some kind of non-aural form? And why did I choose pellets? Well, I didn't choose pellets first. <laughs> I'll tell you the little story about how that happened. Uh, so I started by using an estradiol patch, and that's a really great idea. Nothing wrong with it, and that's a very legitimate way to get estradiol in our system. So estradiol patches you can get from your regular pharmacy. Doesn't need to come from a compounding pharmacy. If you have insurance, chances are they might cover some or all of it. They're little stickers, different brands, now available in generic, about the size of a quarter or so. The current ones are a little square, actually not even round. And you just stick it on your tummy or wherever you want to, but I used to put mine kind of under my underwear line partly so I could see it and confirm that it was there because they do occasionally fall off. Uh, but current estradiol patches are great and they deliver estradiol into our bloodstream in a relatively even manner. And I wanna dig into that a little bit because it's not as even as you might think, unfortunately. We change them twice a week. Now there is a brand that you change once a week but that absorption is even less reliable. So let's just say if we're doing a patch in my opinion, the best one would be the twice a week kind. There's a brand called Vivel Dot, D-O-T, meaning it's little, but that's now available in generic form, so you don't have to pay a lot of money for the Vivel brand anymore. You can get it generic because their patent ran out, which is always good when that happens, right? So you put the patch on, change it. I used to change mine every Monday and Thursday, and that was fine, and it eliminated that first pass through the liver that happens if we take a pill 
that causes all the potential problems with blood clotting and so on. So that sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? But here's a little couple of issues with it. And not to say it's a bad idea. Like I said, I used it myself for a couple of years. One would think that, and one is told <laughs> by the manufacturers that you get a very stable level of estradiol with the patch. Well, you don't. When you stick the patch on, initially levels go up very high. So just say you put it on Monday. If we drew your blood on Tuesday, we'd get a very high level. And if we do it on Thursday, right before you replace it with a new one, that level could be very low. So before I understood the importance of checking blood levels of hormones, my assumption was they were the same all the time. Well, having done lots and lots of these blood tests in my office, we see, for example, patients on day one of a patch might have an estradiol level of, I'll make up a number, 250, really high. That is too high for a postmenopausal woman, by the way. And then on day four, we might see a level of 20, which is too low for a postmenopausal woman. We really wanna keep the level somewhere between about let's just say 50 to 100 plus or minus in order to get rid of all those yucky symptoms, which kick in when the numbers get lower than 40 or so, and not provide other side effects like breast tenderness, water retention, weight gain, bleeding, all kinds of yucky things happen when our estradiol gets too high. So we don't want it over 100 and we don't need it over 100 for all of those health benefits. So there is that narrow window where we get not only the benefit for our health, but we also don't introduce other side effects. So if you're wearing a patch, this is something that happens uh, to many of my patients, they might start having hot flashes on day four because their levels drop too low, and they might get breast tenderness on day one. So there's just a lot of fluctuation up and down during the week. And then there's enormous difference between what one patient might experience with the exact same dose and another because we have different types of skin. We live in different environments with different temperatures. We have different exercise patterns. Some of us swim for an hour every day and other people sit on the couch. Those women are gonna have different blood levels of estradiol from the patch. It's a sticker, but there's a minuscule amount of space between the patch and your skin and sometimes it will fall off. I was doing a lot of triathlons when I was wearing the patch and I would swim and it would sometimes come off and of course then it didn't work. I remember sometimes I would be in a really grumpy mood and whoever was at the other end of that might say, are you wearing your patch? And I would look down and say, no, but you're still a jackass. <laughs> Probably wasn't actually true because my levels had crashed and I was feeling horrible. So we just were not feeling stable. So creams, another option that many patients choose, just multiply all of that by tenfold. Very variable absorption. When you use an estradiol cream, we have no idea how much of that you're going to absorb. It's just a complete guess. <laughs> and we know this from drawing blood levels on patients who are using cream. If you put a cream on, the level's gonna shoot up really high shortly after you put it on, and then it's gonna disappear. This is a common thing I've seen in my office. A patient who put cream on 24 hours ago will have her blood drawn and her estradiol is zero. I mean, it just could be that significant. It just literally disappears. So by no means are you getting a stable level of hormone if you use a cream. And then surprisingly also when you use a patch, there's quite a bit of up and down. So in my opinion and my experience as a menopausal patient, I don't want my hormones going up and down when I'm menopausal. I want everything to be pretty stable. That's where we feel the best. You know, when we were young and fertile, our hormones did go up and down. Granted, they fluctuated with our period. And that didn't always feel great, did it? Remember PMS the week before our period? Sometimes we had breast tenderness around ovulation. One of the beautiful things about menopause is we get the opportunity to have hormones that are stable all the time. So why on earth wouldn't we just choose that? <laughs> so eventually, after dealing with the patch for a couple of years, and I felt pretty good, but I would have hot flashes sometimes on day four. It would fall off and I wouldn't notice because it's not always obvious when it falls off. And then I have red hair, so I'd get little red circles everywhere. My skin would get irritated from the glue. All of those things were manageable if that was the only option available to me. And many of you may not have any other option, so it's a great option. Don't get me wrong if you don't have access to hormone pellets. So don't let the good be the enemy of the great. 
<laughs> if you can only get a hormone patch, that is a fantastic idea. If you have access to a pellet, let me tell you why that might be a little bit better, or at least in my case, it was a lot better. So hormone pellets are little tiny things. I've got lots of videos about them. Uh, estradiol pellets are actually really tiny, like smaller than a grain of rice. They come in all different doses, so we can customize a dose for an individual patient that would be based on weight, age, and your starting level of estradiol. So for me, it was based on a starting level of zero, <laughs> as it might be for many of you, and then factoring in my weight and age. There's a little calculator that is published that providers can use. Frankly, after doing lots and lots of thousands of pellets, I don't use it anymore. I can estimate that dose without doing that. But less experienced providers are wise to use that calculator. And another piece of wisdom is not to give the dose the calculator suggests but to drop it down even from there because there is a subset of patients that just absorb things more quickly than others and are more sensitive to things more than others. So what we don't want to get with a pellet is, is levels that are too high. So if your provider is using that little calculator because they may not have the experience to do dosing without it, I personally would request they do not give you that dose but they drop it down a little bit lower because in my opinion and my experience, that calculator is a bit aggressive. So estradiol pellets go under your skin, which is a fantastic idea because it bypasses all of those potential issues that we talked about with creams and patches with differences in skin, temperature, if you're swimming or working out or sweating or what have you, absorption is gonna be very unpredictable to say the least. So putting this under your skin bypasses everything to do with that. And now it's in the body fat, about a centimeter under your skin. I've got lots of videos about how pellets are placed. It's so easy. It literally takes 90 seconds or less to place a pellet. Uh, and then they stay there for about three months. Uh, so in a pellet, there's absolutely nothing except bioidentical hormone. And then a powder that it's packed in, it's a benign powder, uh, stearic acid and or ethyl cellulose, just for you nerdy scientists who want to look that up. Those are benign powders that pills are packed in. You've got to stick it in something, right? And then they're pressed with a very fancy press to make them into these very, very t densely packed little tiny pellets. And they time release dissolve quite evenly throughout that three month period of time. So estradiol, when we have done a lot of studies, and people have done a lot of studies on pellets, by the way, so when doctors say there are no studies about pellets, that is a bunch of baloney. They just haven't read them. <laughs> there are hundreds of studies about hormone pellets. In any case, um, what we see is that the estradiol level comes up quite quickly because it is a very strong hormone. We've already talked about how estradiol is a stronger hormone than testosterone. So within three to five days, uh, you'll see a complete resolution of your symptoms if you're having hot flashes, night sweats, and so on. If we drew your blood, now we don't generally do this outside of a study, but you, if you were starting from zero, within five days or so, you'd be up above 50 where your symptoms would be resolved. And then within seven to 14 days, you're going to reach a steady state, and it will stay pretty much the same for about 12 weeks, and then it will just take a nose dive and disappear. So we want to give the next pellet right about when that other one is starting to drop so that they cross over and you don't end up in a hole. So with appropriately dosed pellets given by someone who knows how to do them, your levels should stay pretty darn stable. Now there's a little bit of a fluctuation where there may be a little dip towards the end of that 12 weeks. And there are other things that affect absorption. If you're a marathon runner or a triathlete like me, you have to do them a little sooner. So I actually give myself my pellets every 10 weeks. That's not common, but occasionally patients exercise enough that they burn them up very quickly like I do. It's just something we learn from experience. If we're giving you pellets, we're following you very closely and coming up with the ideal interval for you, which is 12 weeks, plus or minus a little bit. Now, if you're a complete couch potato, you might be able to go 14 weeks. So there's a bit of fluctuation in there, but just suffice to say, the levels are pretty stable 24 seven for quite a number of weeks, which is fantastic if you've been suffering with the highs and lows of perimenopause and the consistent lows of menopause. So that might be one argument why pellets are better. Now it's the same exact stuff, right? We're talking about bioidentical 
plant-based estradiol. The mode in which it's delivered, you can pick one, whichever one suits your lifestyle. A cream, a patch, a pellet, even an injection. I didn't even mention those because I don't know anybody who wants to get an injection every week or two. But anything that bypasses the liver will be safe. And then we just have to talk about the pros and cons, which I've discussed. So you can possibly see why pellets are very attractive in that way. And it's certainly a bit of a hassle to come in every three months to get a new pellet. And it's not something that's available to everybody because not everyone has a pellet provider in their neighborhood. But if you're looking for one, uh, you could check on the websites for BioT. That's one of the bigger pellet manufacturers, BioT.com. Another one that we primarily use in my office, Avexius. We'll put those links below and they can show you the providers in your local area. There are other pellet providers too, but those are two that are Dallas-based that are very, very reputable that uh, we certainly use in our office and I've used both of them in my own body. So with lots of experience drawing blood on women who are getting estradiol pellets, without a doubt, we see a much more even delivery than when, with any of the other choices. So if having an even level of hormones is important to you, that might be something to consider. Now, what are the arguments against pellets? Well, the, the main one that I hear all the time, more of a fear is, well, what if I don't like it? Or what if I have a problem with it and I'm stuck with it for 12 weeks? Because you're absolutely right about that. You cannot take a pellet out. Now, being stuck with it is a good thing, in my opinion, because you don't have to do anything for three months. But the flip side of that is that if you got the wrong dose, if you were given too much in particular, you may have to put up with some unpleasant side effects for three months. And that's no joke if you're having breast tenderness, bleeding, weight gain, water retention. You know, it can be significant. I've seen patients uh, from elsewhere who were getting pellets and had estrogen levels of 400, 500, <laughs> way too high, and they felt horrible. So like everything, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And it's critical to see someone who knows how to dose correctly. And in my opinion, will start very conservatively. Because if we're starting at zero, we don't need that much. We don't need to have an estradiol level of 300. That feels horrible. 50 would be fine for most patients. And I feel really good when mine's around 50 or 60. And I try to keep mine very low, uh, just high enough but not too high because I don't want to gain weight. I don't want to have water retention, moodiness, breast tenderness, bleeding. I get it. Who wants to have all that stuff? That's awful. We're trying to get rid of side effects, not introduce any new ones. So that's a really good argument or thought process. Well, what if I don't like it? There's really nothing in there you could be allergic to. It's benign powder that you've been exposed to all of your life and this bioidentical hormone that you've been exposed to all of your life. So other than getting the right technician because placing a pellet is incredibly easy but does require a significant amount of training. So you want to have someone, in my opinion, who is a gynecologist or someone trained by a gynecologist like a women's health nurse practitioner. That's who we use in our office to place our pellets. Of course, I do them too, but a well-trained women's health nurse practitioner is going to be a fantastic option. Who she's supervised by is critical <laughs> because it's not too hard to get the ability to place pellets. Um, you could get them done by a chiropractor or a dentist or goodness knows whom. And some of them are probably very good, but let's just say it's likely that endocrinology is not their specialty. So you don't want me straightening your back. <laughs> you probably don't want me taking out your teeth, but I'm pretty good at doing pellets and I have them in my own body. So that's the information about the estradiol portion of what could go in the pellet. And the other hormone that could go in the pellet, you could get one or both, and I would recommend both, is testosterone. And I talked last week all about the benefits of testosterone, so I won't go over that again, but the same exact logic applies. What options do we have for testosterone? Well, we don't even have a testosterone patch yet. We will one day, hopefully, but it will have the same pros and cons that the estradiol patch has. It'll be wonderful if we could have a combination patch. That would be fantastic. FDA, please do that for us. But in the short term, we can get testosterone compounded by very good compounding pharmacies in the form of a cream, which I don't have a single patient 
want to do that. I tried it myself and within 48 hours I tossed it because it's way too difficult. You've got to measure it perfectly, which is impossible. Put it on, dry your arms, don't touch the kids, don't touch the dog. <laughs> Don't go to the gym. I mean, it's way too high maintenance. And then what we see with that, if patients do commit to the hard work of putting cream on twice a day, is you get a very high spike about a couple hours after the cream is placed, and then it completely disappears. So even if you're doing it twice a day, we see this very high and low pattern. In fact, patients using cream have a much higher incidence of side effects ironically, because a lot of people talk about side effects from pellets, but because the level shoots up so high with the cream, much more likely to get oily skin, acne, hair growth, things like that, because we see very high levels, like 500 or who knows what, and then dropping down to zero. It's very, very difficult. It's impossible, actually, to get a stable level when you're using a testosterone cream. Another way to get it is in some form that dissolves in your mouth. So testosterone could come in the form of what's called a trochee. Those are little things that dissolve under your tongue. Again, you'd want to do it twice a day to get the most even level or drops or other forms that compounders can make. And all of them are good options and also fall into the same list of problems that we've already talked about where it goes up and down and doesn't stay stable. Pellets, on the other hand, and I talked a lot about this last week, do stay very stable for about 12 weeks. So with testosterone, we're going to see the levels come up, and in about two to four weeks, it's going to reach its steady state, and then it's going to stay there and then disappear again. So again, we want to do the pellet about every 12 weeks for the average patient, and we'll see pretty stable levels, which just sounds great to me. And when I switched from using a patch and a tried to use testosterone cream for a little while, as I mentioned, to the pellet, I was like, good Lord, why didn't I do this years ago? <laughs> what a better option. So I can swim, I can run around, I can travel, I can do whatever I want to, and I'm getting a little bit of estradiol and testosterone all the time, and I don't have to do anything. And for those of us who are busy, we're certainly not lazy, but we're really busy. Who wants to try to keep up with something twice a day? It just was way too much for me. So that's why pellets, in my opinion, are the preferred method for getting both estradiol and testosterone. And again, all of the fears, almost without exception, every Google review that you've seen with a negative opinion about hormone pellets are because the patient got too much almost always got too much. If it's anything to do with side effects, she got too much. All of those things. Now, of course, if testosterone's too high, we will see masculinizing effects, even enlargement of the clitoris or deepening of the voice or growing a beard. And people doing a transgender transition would do that on purpose. I mean, so we know that high levels of testosterone can literally develop male features in a, someone who is born female. We don't want that if we're a cisgender postmenopausal woman. So I keep my testosterone level somewhere in the 100 to 150 range. Other providers, I've heard light levels up to 250. I don't think that's wise. When we see levels over 200, side effects start to go up. And I like to not have any side effects in my practice. So we try to keep our levels somewhere from, from the 100 to 150 range. And the only way to know is to do some blood testing. So about six weeks after your pellet, we draw your blood, check the levels, see where we are. Did we nail it? Did we get in that 50 to 100 range for estradiol, 100 to 150 range for testosterone? And you will not have a lot of trouble if you have slightly high levels for a short time. So worst case scenario, if those levels are a little high after the first pellet, we'll just drop it down the second time. Now, more than 90% of the time, we get it right the first time. But if there's an error, we want it to be on the low side because it's really easy to give you a little bit more, but obviously you can't take it out. So if it gets too high, you may endure some unpleasant side effects for three months and we do not want to do that. So be really, really careful where you get your pellets placed. And I would have a conversation with the provider and just ask them not to give you the amount that the dosing calculator suggests. Now, it requires really advocating for yourself, but I would ask them, what dose did you calculate for me? And please don't give me that much. 
really, really do that because that dosing calculator is too aggressive and if doctors use it, they're gonna have about 10% of patients who end up with side effects and that is way too much for me. I don't want any side effects at all. And in our practice, our side effect rate is very, very tiny. So the third hormone, progesterone, doesn't go in the pellet. So why is that? Uh, a couple of reasons. One is that progesterone is actually a pretty large molecule and it's not very well absorbed through the skin or even through the subcutaneous tissue. So progesterone creams, uh, they just don't do very much. There's no study that's shown that progesterone cream given in a transdermal manner reduces the risk of uterine cancer, for example. It also doesn't make you sleepy, which is the primary reason I take it. I take progesterone at night by mouth it's very safe for the liver, doesn't cause any blood clotting issues or anything else, and it makes you sleepy. And since most of us suffer from insomnia or have some type of sleep disruption issues going on around the time of menopause, not only does it reduce the risk of uterine cancer, but it also helps you sleep well. It's also great for hair, skin, nails, moods, anxiety, headaches, lots of other things. So progesterone would be given by mouth, estradiol, and testosterone in the pellet. And I do believe, as I said, from my own experience as a patient and from treating thousands of women, that that is the best option for most women. And I recognize it's not available for everybody. So patch is choice number two, if you cannot get a pellet. And let's talk just for a second about men, because hormone pellets for men, I made a video about that recently, really important also. Uh, men, of course, lose testosterone throughout their lives, just like we do. And hormone pellets for men, great idea. They get way more than we do, of course. So the dosing for a man my age would be about 20 times the dose that I get. So about 20 times more, much, much more. So we're looking for levels in men somewhere 800 to 1200 or so, rather than 100 to 150, totally different dosing. And so because men get much more material in the form of a pellet, there's a little bit more opportunity for things like bruising, swelling, pain. So using a pellet that has a little bit of an anti-inflammatory in it is really very important for male pellet placement, I think. And I talked about that in a previous video. Uh, we use Avexius brand pellets for men because they have a patent that was just very recently approved, I think, this week on uh, putting an anti-inflammatory in the pellet. So it really reduces pain, inflammation, bruising, all of those things that men had to suffer with occasionally with pellet placement prior to that advancement. So uh, Avexius pellets uh, for men, I think are great because they've got a little bit of, little teeny tiny bit of triamcinolone in there, which is a steroid, which acts as an anti-inflammatory, but it's such a minuscule dose. It doesn't have any systemic effects. For example, it doesn't raise your blood sugar, doesn't cause any other symptoms that you would see with steroids that are given in a high oral dose. Just a teeny tiny bit so that it reduces inflammation around the pellet site itself. So for men, I also think pellets are better than injections for reasons that we've talked about before, but just to review, um, injections are not bioidentical testosterone. In general, they're either testosterone propionate or cyprionate, which who cares what that is, but your liver cares. In order to make it bioavailable, your liver's still gotta do a lot of work. Even, ironically, it's not given by mouth, but it still has to go through the liver to clean it up, and because of that, you've got to have your liver enzymes checked regularly because it can be bad for your liver, and who wants that? We've only got one liver, and we wanna keep it really healthy. So testosterone pellets, because for men or women, because they are bioidentical testosterone, not bad for the liver. Liver doesn't mind them at all, because they don't take a, what's called a first pass through the liver. So the liver, you gotta think about like a giant washing machine. It's cleaning everything up that we're ingesting, everything in our bloodstream. It's a critical organ, and we want to let it have time to do its other important work and not be cleaning up nasty drugs and chemicals that it's being exposed to. So bioidentical testosterone and pellet form checks all those boxes. And for guys, they only have to get them about every five months because they're getting so much more, naturally it lasts a little bit longer. So just a little more info on hormone pellets. I have them in my own bottom. We've got lots of videos here on our social media about how pellets are placed, some recent videos showing pellet placement and how quick and easy it is, so check those out. If you like this episode, please don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, and I can't wait to see you next week. <music>